Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jeff Kenvin, and I'm the Vice President of Science at Micromernics Instrument Corporation. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple engagement tools you may use. You can extend your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if we run out of time, we'll be answered later via email. Additional materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. Some networks can cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off of your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. If you experience any problems during the session, you can find answers to some common technical lo issues located in the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available after today's webcast and will be emailed to you once the session has concluded. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Professor Mike Zawaratko. Mike is the Bernal Chair of Crystal Engineering at the University of Limerick. Previously, he enjoyed faculty positions at St. Mary's University, Canada, the University of Winnipeg, and the University of South Florida. His research is focused on the synthesis and application of ultramicroporous materials and pharmaceutical materials with an emphasis on crystal engineering. Mike currently enjoys an H index of 111 and more than 50,000 citations of his published work. Professor Zawatko, it is an honor for me to introduce you today. We are so glad you could be here today to share your insights on why crystal materials will save the world. Hello, my name is Mike Zavarotko, and it's my pleasure to have the opportunity today to tell you a crystal engineering story, a crystal engineering story about how we're finally in a position to develop new crystalline materials that can impact global challenges. Before I start, I'd like to thank Jeff Kenvin and the Micromeritics team for making this opportunity possible, and also to thank you for your time in listening to me today. This is the outline of my presentation, and I'm gonna start by telling you about the when and the where of crystal design. So let's talk about what a crystal is. Uh, they come in all shapes, sizes, colors, and compositions. And I think it's fair to say that most people, if not all people, love crystals. But from my perspective, at least, some of them are a lot more important than others. These would include the two types of crystals I've highlighted uh, with these images in the middle and on the right, pharmaceutical polymorphs and coordination polymers. Uh, it's fair to say that they both have significant uh, utility. Uh, diamonds have some utility, but not as much as uh, pharmaceutical compounds and coordination networks. Why are crystals of particular interest in these contexts? First of all, uh, they're likely to be pure. They're also likely to be stable. They're also likely to have reproducible properties, processability, and in the case of the right hand crystals, porosity. Uh, nevertheless, uh, even today, uh, unlike molecules where we can predict their structure and properties with a great degree of reliability, the same is not so for crystals. Uh, so crystals are not necessarily amenable to design from first principles. And that's the theme of my presentation today. The dream of crystal design dates back to at least 1959, when Richard Feynman presented his famous series of lectures that many people regard to be the dawn of nanoscience. During these lectures, he asked this question, what would the properties of materials be if we could really arrange the atoms the way we want them? And he had a very profound answer. We will get an enormously greater range of possible properties that substances can have and of different things that we can do. This is the motivation for crystal engineering. Today, crystal engineering has evolved considerably since its beginnings. 
uh, and it can be termed the field of chemistry that studies the design properties and applications of crystals. It's possible to get inspiration for crystal engineering from art, and M.C. Escher is particularly well known for his work, which has been uh, found in many crystallography labs around the world since the 1950s. Uh, it was in the 1970s that Wells, in his book, Three Dimensional Nets and Polyhedra, connected topology, which you see uh, in the left-hand Escher diagram, and crystal structures, when he categorized and classified minerals according to their connectivity uh, and topology. From a personal perspective, uh, the dream of crystal engineering almost began for me when my chemistry dream started, when I was an undergraduate student at Imperial College in 1977. Uh, in this photograph, uh, which highlights how different things are today, because females were significantly underrepresented at that time. Fortunately, that's not the case today. Uh, in this photograph, in the front row, are two very distinguished professors of chemistry. Uh, on the right there, Professor Jeffrey Wilkinson, who won the Nobel Prize in 1973, the year before I joined Imperial College and Richard Barra, the pioneer of modern synthetic zeolite chemistry, who is professor of physical chemistry. Uh, as it turns out, my first scientific paper was with Wilkinson, and I had to wait a long time before I published a paper related to Barra's field, which is porous materials. Uh, I particularly wanted to mention this because Barra uh, is going to appear later in the presentation today. What is crystal engineering was actively being developed in the 1970s, especially in the group of Schmidt in Israel. It was fair to say that in general, crystal engineering was still regarded as an oxymoron, as exemplified by this quote from an editorial that John Maddox, the editor of Nature at the time, published in 1988. As it turns out, 1988 was actually a watershed year when everything was about to change. Let's talk about the first crystal engineering baby steps. In other words, those design steps that resulted in crystal structures that were designed from first principles. So what happened in 1988? Um, here you see a paper which I'm calling Crystal Engineering 101 which is a report of the self-assembly of adamantane tetracarboxylic acid through hydrogen bonds to form a diamondoid or DIA network by design. Uh, some people would now call these hydrogen bonded organic frameworks or HOFs. Uh, there were two interesting aspects of this paper, not just the self-assembly into the predictable network, but also the existence of interpenetration which in this case was fivefold interpenetrated. This structure relied upon hydrogen bonding, as I mentioned, specifically the carboxylic acid dimer, which is where hydrogen bonding was originally defined. I should acknowledge uh, the contributions of Jim Wiest in this area, who developed similar uh, molecules to produce predictable structures uh, he coined the term tectons to describe these molecules. Crystal Engineering 102 was published in 1989 when Richard Robson and Bernard Hoskins showed that you could self-assemble using coordination bonds also to build DIA or diamondoid networks. In this case, a tetrahedral tetracyano ligand and tetrahedral metals together self-assembled to build a diamondoid network, in this case without interpenetration, to the extent that large cavities were generated that included 7.7 .7 molecules of nitrobenzene per atom of copper. Uh, interestingly, this ligand has not been widely studied since. Uh, the Cambridge Structural Database only has two entries with this ligand. So it's fair to say that this compound is the precursor of what we now call MOFs. 
Crystal Engineering 103 came a little bit later from the group of Resnati and Matrangolo in Milan, Italy, when they reported the self-assembly via halogen bonds to build DIA networks using a tetrakey spiridyl ligand and a dihalo linker to build the diamond dyed network. Uh, by now you'll have figured out that I might not be so keen on diamonds, but I certainly love diamond dyed networks. So what do these individual success stories teach us? By 1990, they'd already taught us how to crystal engineer porous coordination networks from first principles using the node and linker principle. Uh, in this case, to build a square lattice network uh, based upon a node, uh, in this case, a four connected node, but a node is any metal or molecular building block with three or more connections, linked by a bifunctional linker ligand a ligand which makes only two connections, the consequence of which was a cavity, a cavity which was almost exactly one nanometer if you take into account the van der Waals surface. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the uh, linker uh, was 44 prime by pyridine. Uh, uh, we know today that both the node and linker have a significant impact on properties, which I'll be discussing shortly. Uh, there are many nodes and many linkers, uh, and more than 100,000 of these network structures. And number one, the number one most widely used linker in these structures with around 6,400 entries is 44 prime BIPI, uh, the linker was, that was used right back in 1990 by Robson and Hoskins. So crystal engineering evolved quite steadily during the 1990s but I doubt that I'd be here talking to you today if it weren't for two very important papers that were published in 1999. On the left, you have HCAST1, and on the right, you have MAR5. Why were these structures so important? Well, they set new benchmarks for properties. Uh, in other words, doing the different things that we can do that was the dream of Feynman in 1959. In this case, uh, surface areas, gravimetric surface areas, of 1900 meters squared per gram and 3000 meters squared per gram, respectively. Before I segue into recently published or unpublished results, I'd like to give you a one slide story of the last 10 years of my life, which is focused upon the development of rigid ultramicroporous materials, which because of their poor size, shape and chemistry, fitting a particular molecular target, have resulted in new benchmarks for trace separations. This all started in 2013 when an undergraduate honors, honors student, Stephen Bird, uh, studied the carbon capture capabilities of CIF63 zinc and found it to be an order of magnitude better for CO2N2 over the previous benchmarks, which were zeolite 13X and magnesium MOF74. Generation two variants have now improved this selectivity by another order of magnitude. This was followed in 2016 by a science paper, which addressed acetylene ethylene selectivity, also beating the previous benchmark by an order of magnitude, and a 2019 science paper, which reported inverse selectivity for ethane over ethylene. Most recently, we've studied benzene from humid air and found a binding site which was capable of trapping benzene even from 10 ppm levels uh, and reducing it to 1 ppb, less than 1 ppb, in breakthrough experiments. I should point out that all of these papers were collaborations. They were not just individual efforts from my group. Now I'd like to switch directions a little and talk about the present and the future. Uh, first of all, I'm going to focus upon porous materials and how they can address uh, several global challenges. In terms of global challenges, at least four can be directly impacted by new and better materials. These include better and cheaper medicines on the top left, uh, improved efficiency for solar energy harvesting on the top right, 
Uh, the bottom two applications or challenges can be directly addressed by porous materials. They are commodity purification, including carbon capture, including direct air capture. And on the bottom right, we have water purification, which is perhaps the most pressing and urgent of all the challenges and the one that I'll focus upon in a moment. Before I get too carried away, I'd like to point out that if only it were as simple as it looks. Simply put, the real world, real world gas mixtures are non-binary. Uh, in this context, breaking up complex gas mixtures is generally really hard to do, mainly because we don't have the selectivity, we don't have the kinetics, we don't have the cost and the energy profile that we would like to have. There are all kinds of uh, what I would call low-lying fruit in terms of targets, including hydrocarbons, uh, also including flue gas, where carbon capture is the main goal. Uh, but the one that I'll be focus on, focusing upon is perhaps the ultimate challenge, which is air, where the things we're interested in, such as water and CO2, are in much lower concentration than they are in the other target commodities. Access to fresh water is perhaps the most urgent of all the global challenges. Simply put, there is no plan B and the situation is bad and getting worse. What I'll be talking about today is the possibility of using porous materials to access atmospheric water, which might appear to be relatively low in terms of its uh, quantity, being only 0.04% of all the available fresh water on the planet, but that is still an enormous amount of water on the order of 10 to the 16 liters. Furthermore, it's inherently renewable because if you remove water from the air, then more will evaporate to replace it. And of course, there already are well-known examples of porous materials uh, zeolites in particular, uh, literally boiling stones, are already widely used as desiccants. So I'm about to tell you about a project that we call Aquasorb. The goal of Aquasorb is to develop what we call regeneration optimized sorbents, or ROS materials, which offer us efficient water capture and release. Uh, this project is a collaboration between my group, uh, a subgroup uh, of my team, and Molecule, a company that's been funding this research for the last three and a half years. So the goal of Aquasorb is systematic development of families of ROS materials for water vapor capture, storage, and release. Uh, there are obvious criteria that they must meet in order to be considered for this purpose including they have to work well at low RH because that's normally where you need the water. They must exhibit high working capacity and they must offer a low energy and fast recycling. What that means is essentially you would like to have one of these green isotherms, what I would call a weak type 1 water absorption isotherm or a low RH pore filling or condensation isotherm. The approach we took in Aquasorb was a three-stage approach. It started by looking at 80 potential desiccants, evaluating them for stability and uptake performance. That reduced it to around 30 candidate desiccants, which were then subjected to more in-depth performance evaluation, as I'll explain in a moment. And it ended up at stage three with four ROS desiccants, each of which was subjected to in-depth testing under real-world testing conditions and investigation of their scale-up uh, into uh, kilogram or even 50 kilogram quantities. This slide summarizes stage two of the Aquasorb project, where by use of various instruments, uh, vapor absorption instruments, we studied simulated humidity swing, simulated temperature swing, and simulated vacuum swing, and addressed parameters such as their recyclability over many cycles, uh, simulated direct water capture from air, kinetics absorption, and the heat absorption. 
Uh, as you can guess, you need quite a lot of uh, absorption instruments to conduct this work. Uh, and my group has assembled uh, 14 absorption instruments to support this project and other projects we're working on. There were a number of interesting outcomes to the Aquisorb project, in some cases quite unexpected to us. Um, absorption kinetics is obviously a key performance parameter, but it's not that clear how to best uh, optimize kinetics for real world performance and how to evaluate kinetics for real world performance. Most of the time in the literature, you see these kind of plots, which are uh, complete loading, complete unloading plots going on for multiple cycles. And obviously it's a good thing if you end up retaining your working capacity through multiple cycles. Um, Andre and Dan in my group um, looked more closely at the rate laws behind these kinetics experiments and figured out that it was more optimal to do partial loading and partial unloading. Uh, and they were able to evaluate the overall performance of the materials with what we call heat maps. In this case, what you see is that for this particular absorbent, that a five minute, five minute cycle is optimal, much more optimal than the full loading, unloading cycle, which you commonly see reported in the literature. As I mentioned, this work is currently submitted and under review. A couple of other interesting outcomes to the Aquisorb project. Uh, first of all, uh, all four of the ROS materials that ended up being the winners, so to speak, are relatively dense, um, which is not the case for most of the benchmark materials that have been reported in the literature. Secondly, uh, we found that in studying various composites, uh, polymer composites and cellulose composites, that 50-50 cellumorph composites, uh, for want of a better term, uh, that term has been used before, uh, offer the optimal performance because as you can see from the imaging, uh, the cellulose is an excellent matrix to expose the full uh, surface area of the uh, MOF or uh, ROS particles. Uh, other composites that we studied uh, involving polymers significantly reduced the performance of the sorbent, but the cellumorph composites retained the performance of the ROS material being studied. To summarize the Aquisorb project, a couple of slides. Uh, first of all, uh, the time frame involved here has been on the order of three years. And during those three years, we started from very low TRL, a preliminary screening, an in-depth screening, all the way through uh, composites, uh, scale-up studies, manufacture, bulk manufacture into paper composites in this time period. Uh, and it's even gone one step further than that because as you'll see on the next slide, we have prototype devices. In parallel with our work on materials development, Molecule were working on device development. And the end result of that device development is what's called the Watco device. A diagram of it uh, is presented right here. Uh, the heart of this device is a desiccant wheel, uh, which involves a composite of cellulose and one of our ROS materials. Uh, multiple companies were involved in this device development, but it was all coordinated and funded by Molecule. The end uh, performance uh, and mechanism of water capture and release is a version uh, of what is known as a Munter's desiccant wheel, which is uh, the large scale dehumidification technology that's used worldwide, including in uh, large building HVAC systems. Uh, in essence, a rotating wheel which works continuously uh, sorbing on one side as uh, humid air is released using heat on the other side. After moving from extra large surface area materials to ultra microporous materials, now I'd like to go one step further down in, in pore size, in fact, to non-porous solids and talk about a subject that 
is certainly understudied, uh, but I feel is going to be far more prevalent uh, than people realize at the moment, and hopefully more relevant than uh, one might realize at the moment. What do I mean by gas vapor absorption in non-porous solids? Well, it turns out uh, that of all people, Richard Barra is the pioneer in this area because he published a paper in 1969 which addressed uh, gas sorption in Werner complexes which were non-porous, in other words, close-packed molecular solids. And if you look at the isotherms collected in this paper, a number of these are type 1 isotherms or stepped isotherms similar to the type that I was talking about for water sorption. Uh, Richard Baer is not the only person who contributed to this area. In 2002, the Atwood Group published a paper in Science on gas vapor absorption in a close-packed calixarine structure, uh, Atwood being my PhD mentor, by the way. The key to the performance of non-porous solids and gas and vapor absorption is that the gas or vapor induces a structural transformation from a non-porous to a porous solid. Uh, as it turns out, there are other examples historically. Uh, I'm not going to read through each of these developments on this slide that we highlight, other than to point out that each of the green lines represents an example of a stimulus-induced transformation from a non-porous solid to a porous solid, uh, a sort of gate opening mechanism. And the type of solid being studied covers all spectrums from 0D molecular solids all the way up to three-dimensional network solids, which undergo, in some cases, dramatically extreme structural changes. Why do we care about these structural transformations? Uh, well, as it turns out, they can be advantageous for both gas and vapor storage and for gas and vapor separations. Gas and vapor storage, because if you have a stepped isotherm, then it's possible to increase the working capacity. Uh, in this case, cobalt BDP, uh, which is one of the earliest examples of a breathing uh, or switching coordination network, uh, was shown uh, by Jeff Long to be, at that point, uh, the benchmark for methane storage under ambient temperatures uh, at relatively low pressures. Uh, because of the stepped isotherm uh, having its uh, step in the right pressure regime. Uh, cobalt BDP has also been studied uh, for separations, uh, as you'll see here. Uh, the gate opening can be uh, selective for a particular sorbate, and in this case it's possible to separate gases based upon which one of those gases uh, induces an early gate opening, also in cobalt BDP. In the middle here we have work from my group, uh, led by Chin Yuan Yang, uh, who studied uh, my favorite networks, diamondite networks, uh, what we call XDIAs or extended diamondite networks, which exhibited methane storage performance very similar to that of cobalt BDP, not quite as high a working capacity, but very close. And here you see the kind of extreme structural changes that can happen in these uh, switching or breathing materials. The mechanisms behind the structural changes that occur during switching of coordination networks uh, can be uh, of multiple types, depending upon the type of network and the chemistry of that network. Here are some of the examples of switching that you can see. And if you're lucky, like one of my students, Mahana, then you might get multiple examples in the same structure. Of course, I really meant unlucky when, when I said he was lucky. Uh, here you see Mahana Shivana. Uh, in this particular situation, a single compound exhibited six different phases with multiple different switching mechanisms between those phases. Uh, when I say unlucky, uh, I'm sure he would have been much happier if he'd had a single transformation 
using one mechanism because an awful amount of hard work went into publishing uh, the story of one compound here, which we called XPCU1, because it's an extended PCU network. Hannah did get lucky with another compound though, uh, which is a uh, 1D channel structure, a narrow pore structure that we call SQL CIF6 BPEZN, in which an induced fit mechanism was observed for acetylene. Uh, what did this mean? Uh, well, the structure actually contracted upon sorption of acetylene as it adapted to acetylene to form a strong binding interaction with acetylene. How strong was that interaction? It was 67.5 kilojoules per mole, which is at or about the world record for binding to acetylene. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means it will store acetylene at room temperature and below one atmosphere of acetylene. So you can load it and walk it down to the X-ray machine uh, without worrying about the acetylene escaping from the porous material. A third example or case study of a switching network from my group uh, is a switching DIA coordination network, uh, which has been studied by my student, uh, Jamma, who is pictured here. Uh, what she found is that her coordination network undergoes reversible switching between a small pore phase and a large pore phase induced by water, uh, by water vapor. Uh, and as you can see from the isotherm, that absorption occurs at around 20% RH, which is the, the ideal humidity for a water harvesting material. Uh, this material uh, is stable through multiple cycles, as you can see from the bottom right chart. Uh, and in addition to that, the kinetics is perhaps surprisingly quite fast and comparable to the best rigid pore materials. Uh, this is a rare example. There are probably only a handful of examples out there of switching coordination networks that could be considered suitable for use in atmospheric water harvesting. The fourth case study describes work from my student Kiriaki, uh, which highlights how by and large unpredictable these transformations are even today. Uh, what you see are two isostructural uh, porous coordination networks where only one atom difference between the ligands uh, and nitrogen instead of a CH group leads to a dramatic difference in the isotherms. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, uh, the in-situ PXRD from these isotherms, coincident with these isotherms, what you'll see is that you have a sudden uh, stepped, single step isotherm for the CH variant, but a type one isotherm where gradual phase changes are occurring for the ASA derivative. Uh, so this is an example of how just one atom uh, can be used to tune the, uh, the isotherm. I'll finish off with a couple of case studies that focus more upon uh, storage. Uh, here you see a case study involving SQL nets uh, long known as it turns out SQL Nats, uh, that was published by my former student Shi Cheng Wang, uh, whose nickname is SQ, so uh, he is uh, naturally the king of SQL Nats, at least in our group. Uh, and what he showed here is that uh, both CO2 and acetylene lead to stepped isotherms, uh, and as you change temperature, uh, you, you change the gate opening pressure. Uh, the key uh, important observation from this work is that the working capacity of this material in terms of acetylene storage um, around that stepped isotherm uh, is not only a benchmark for sorbents, but it's a benchmark compared to the current technology for acetylene storage, which involves dissolving it in acetone, which is placed in a monolith inside a pressurized cylinder. 
Uh, in this particular case, the 1 to 15 bar working capacity in particular was higher in the SQL net than in any of the previous uh, examples of acetylene storage materials. Uh, I will save the oddest uh, for last uh, because what I'm talking about here is transient porosity um, in a network that we call XDMP-1-CO, uh, studied by my former postdoc Varia, who noticed that a clathrate phase could be formed and that it could be converted to other clathrate phases uh, as pressure was increased before it finally hit a porous phase. Uh, and these transformations were fully reversible. So what we're looking at here is another type of situation where you're getting gas sorption in a non-porous material, but this time between clathrate phases, which could have significant implications for storage of the most volatile gases and vapors. Uh, if you look at the mechanism, the transient porosity is enabled by uh, uh, thermal motion, uh, according to modeling, in the coordination network. I would like to conclude with a few take-home messages and then explain what my title slide means. So what have we learned about design and properties from the sum of this work? Well, I'd like to paraphrase uh, Apple. Uh, it's not think differently, but think supramolecularly uh, because everything I've talked about from the beginning, the design up to the properties, essentially relies upon supramolecular chemistry. Uh, Host-guest interactions, uh, reversible bond formation, both uh, non-covalent and coordinate covalent bonds. And last and not least, the creation of what amounts to a high density of binding sites in a material in order to enhance the selectivity for a particular target molecule. I don't want to give the impression that our ROS materials are, have saved the world. Uh, it is our goal to create new materials that could have a large uh, impact upon several global challenges. Uh, but we're a long way from that. Uh, there are multiple performance parameters that have to be addressed before a material is fully developed. Uh, I would like to point out that one of these is controllable in advance, and it's cost. Um, the cost of the ingredients that go into our material, uh, the safety of those materials, is something that we can control. And as I like to say to my group, uh, even if you limit yourselves to only the cheapest everyday ingredients and the cheapest and most suitable metals such as zinc and iron, there is still, in effect, an infinite number of new porous materials that could be made. Take-home message number three uh, addresses how important modeling is to providing insight into what is behind the uh, structural changes and the selectivity performance that we've been observing in our lead materials. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge especially uh, the uh, importance of our collaboration with Brian Space, who leads the 231st Space Group, uh, shown here, who is now at North Carolina State University. We've published uh, around 50 papers with Brian, uh, and there's no question that without the modeling, uh, we would be handicapped from developing the next generation of porous materials. Uh, the example I show here is where we first cottoned on to the idea that narrow pore materials are going to be much superior to wide pore materials for small gas separations. Take home message number four also relates to the need to gain insight, uh, structural insight, into what's going on during sorption, including especially to the phase changes that occur. Uh, in this particular situation, I'd like to take you back to the, to the Barra paper and one set of isotherms in his paper, which show the, the absorption of xenon on the Werner clathrate complex. And what you see here is that high mass percents, as much as 40%, uh, 
could be adsorbed into the verniclathrate at quite low partial pressures, uh, 10, 20, 30 millimeters of mercury. To this day, we have no idea what's going on in terms of structural changes in this system. Uh, so gaining insight through in situ uh, structural observations is something that we need uh, to do more often and better. Uh, and hopefully uh, there will be a, a, an exciting announcement from Mi Micromeritics about this in the near future. I'd like to conclude by going back to my title slide. Uh, what does all of this add up to? Uh, where can we do things differently that we couldn't do before? Uh, and I'd like to suggest that there are several new opportunities that are now on the table including one-step purification of complex gas mixtures, such as direct air capture, uh, being able to capture water anywhere, anytime, uh, atmospheric water harvesting, and possibly even combining the two of these into converting CO2 from air and water into carbohydrates in the form of food or in the form of fuel. And if you think this is a bit too far-fetched, well, all you have to do is go to the movies. Uh, the Martian uh, and Dune uh, both give you examples of where the practical reality uh, has to be addressed. And I think that porous materials uh, are the way forward in this context. I'll finish by thanking the people who did all the work. Uh, I've mentioned number of specific people uh, today, but uh, my group is, uh, and I'm proud to say my group is very diverse in terms of culture and in terms of gender, uh, and that uh, 18 flags have flown over my group since I moved to Ireland in 2013. I'd also like to thank you for joining today uh, to listen to my uh, preaching on the subject of crystal engineering. Uh, and also thank the funding sources that have supported this work, uh, both academic and industrial. Thank you again for your attention today. Thank you, Mike. Um, I am open out for everyone's questions now, and we already have a few. Um, early in your presentation, you showed that really nice Watco uh, device. How much water is typically produced from one of those devices, either per hour or per day? Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, the, the normal measure is liters of water per day. Um, and uh, at this point, we're talking uh, per kilogram, uh, sorry, liters of water per kilogram of material per day. Uh, and based upon our laboratory testing, it's on the order of 20 to 30 liters per day. And the field testing that's occurring is suggesting that our laboratory uh, testing is correct. Great. In that cycle, you go from what we might consider the, the paper <laughs> having being loaded with water to then being regenerated and unloaded. What kind of change is that in actual loading uh, of the paper? Into it probably doesn't get completely dry during the unloading. Right. So, so the paper cellulose itself has a uh, uh, has surface option of water of a couple of percent, maybe. Uh, so that's actually in addition to the the sorbent. Uh, but the sorbent is where most of the action is happening. Uh, and it varies depending upon the cycling. Uh, so, uh, I, and so the diagram I showed was, uh, and I, I wouldn't say it was anatomically correct, um, but what you would be something like perhaps 30% to 70% and cycling back and forth between those two levels because you're catching the kinetics, the faster kinetics on the loading that way. Uh, so I, I just alluded to the, the rate uh, laws associated with these processes, but you know most of the time you want to catch it in the middle, 
uh, of the curve to, to optimize both loading and unloading. So I so we've run about half loaded, half unloaded, but we can go much faster that way. Great. About how long is each cycle? Again, that varies, but you can you can almost dial in. A, 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 a given a different material will have an optimal cycling. Uh, there are some where the loading is faster, relatively speaking, than the unloading. So you could have something like a five-minute, ten-minute cycle, or you could have others where the loading is slower, but, but you you can move the unloading faster. Uh, and uh, so it could switch around. Uh, but we're generally aiming of, for ten to fifteen-minute cycles. Which is consistent with the um, dehumidification uh, desiccant wheel processes. Uh, they uh, they tend to uh, cycle in around every 15 minutes. Um, why did you attach um, your material to the cellulose rather than using it in bead form or some other morphology? Well, yeah. Well, that that is uh, that is uh, a great question because we had assumed we would be using uh, pellets or beads, um, but uh, it turns out that uh, the kinetics of of a pellet is is much slower than the uh, uh, kinetics of a surface exposed solvent. So the purpose of the cellulose is that you can form it into something that looks like an air filter in a car. Uh, which maximizes the surface area and the mass transfer and the heat transfer. Uh, so uh, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, I had a role in this, but I'm not a real engineer. I, I didn't point that out. Crystal engineering, I do the chemistry, but other people uh, do the engineering, uh, in, especially Kurt Francis at, at Molecule. But the, the cellulose composites, after a... a Many experiments were determined to be the most optimal method for dehumidification on a large scale, continuous dehumidification on a large scale. Uh, and so, in essence, we're we're learning from that. But we did test other other uh, other composites, and we did test pellets. Uh, and and it's it's simply that the performance uh, deteriorates significantly. Uh, and when you make pellets or when you use other poly uh, other composite materials such as polymers, which tend to coat the surface of the particles. You showed those really beautiful pictures, the images of the crystals on uh, the cellulose. What was the t do you have any good data on what, what was the typical size of some of those crystals or even just what was the smallest crystal versus the largest crystal? Yes, we, we do focus. Particle size is an important uh, factor in terms of kinetics um, and is something we take into account when, when we're, or I should say Andre and Dan took into account when they uh, uh, looked at the kinetics models. Uh, but the, uh, they're generally 1 to 10 microns, um, and we aim for 50% by weight of sorbent 50% by weight of cellulose. Again, that is kind of the ballpark that you find in desiccant wheels used for dehumidification. Uh, the difference being that we're working at much lower humidity levels for atmospheric water harvesting. That's So conventional um, uh, desiccants um, uh, will not function as effectively at low humidity. Uh, that's why we need a new a new type of sorbent here. So maybe this question is obvious, and I apologize. It's a personal question for asking a really obvious question. Um, from everything you presented on the Aquasorb, this um, material deposited on the cellulose, is this a drop-in replacement for a current desiccant? Or do they need some modification to the hardware? That's the potential beauty of this is that, yes, if you can capture uh, water at 20% humidity, you can certainly capture water at 70% humidity. Uh, and 
yes, the the dehumidification is probably the most immediate application. I I, I can't really speak for molecule, but uh, no, the, the 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 need for dehumidification is that it's hugely energy intensive because you have to need a lot of heat to recover or recycle uh, the desiccant. Uh, uh, whereas our materials, so I didn't point this out. I know there was another question on this. Uh, the, the the heat needed is actually much lower for these uh, materials with the stepped isotherms. Uh, typically, at 50 or 60 degrees Celsius, the, the water is released. So you're making water boil at 50 or 60, and you're condensing it more easily uh, than than it would in the real world. Uh, so that uh, is a huge bonus. Is that uh, dehumidification is the uh, the most energy intensive part of HVAC systems, uh, and uh, the potential here is to significantly reduce the energy footprint of dehumidification uh, in HVAC systems uh, and in other applications industrially. Uh, so it's it's a kind of win-win where you could actually. Uh, have both water harvesting uh, enabled uh, and dehumidification having a greatly reduced footprint by by using these physisorbents which have the condensation isotherms. Uh, and we're not talking 5% reduction. You know, we're talking significant reduction in the energy footprint because you heating to 50 or 60 degrees is is, uh, is a significant the uh, easier step than heating to 100 plus degrees. So, so a, a, a question related to that: How much uh, has has anyone estimated how much? What, what's the reduction in CO2? Because you're not expending all that energy during re, to uh, regenerate the material. Uh, well, I'm not a life cycle uh, analyst, but we do collaborate with a life cycle analyst. Uh, uh, there's a project which I alluded to uh, in my title slide repeated, uh, food from air and fill from air. Uh, what do you do with the CO2 when you capture it, right? So, so yes, on the, on the Dehumidification side, reducing the energy cost reduces the CO2 footprint. But what if you can actually capture CO2 and actually use it uh, and fill uh, uh, using algae to produce uh, carbohydrate fills, alcohols, uh, and a kind of a super low energy efficient version of hydroponics where you capture water and CO2 to grow food is close to negative on CO2, because um, you're capturing the CO2 from the air. There is some energy involved, and you have to amortize it out over the cost of the lifetime of the of the device. But, uh, you know, so the name of that project is C-, uh, and, and it offers the idea of being able to uh, make fuel and food from air by capturing CO2 and water in an energy efficient fashion. Um, the second part of your talk, you really discussed uh, quite a bit on structural transformations uh, during adsorption. Um, in these systems, and as you're changing, let's say, confinement to pore size, um, does that cause any unexpected adsorption of other species um, because you're yeah. changing um, sizes? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. Uh, when we started this work, uh, I'm not the uh, pioneer in this area, uh, but when we started this work uh, six or seven years ago, we had envisaged that storage would be the the obvious application that, that you could get rid of the uh, early part of the absorption curve and, and essentially loading equals working capacity if you have a, a stepped isotherm at the right place. What we didn't see is the potential that if there was a highly selective step, if the material was, uh, was responded to a particular zorbate much more than it did to other zorbates, that you might be able to get into separations. And, and what you're seeing now is that more and more 
if there is high selectivity, i.e. a stronger binding for a particular gas, it's because the material is adapting to the gas, right? So in fact, it's not the case that this is always going to happen because there are other materials where there's co-adsorption. But in, in some of these cases, the open phase is, is a highly selective binding site for the gas that caused the opening. The, the only issue is it might not work well for trace because the step might not open at 400 ppm for CO2, right? But more often, I, I would go as far as to say more often than not, when there's selectivity suggested by the isotherms, it translates into an opportunity for separations. Uh, and I know there, there was another question about the kinetics. And when we embarked on this, I would have said, well, there's no way the whole structure can change as fast as a rigid material can absorb, uh, absorbate, right? But more and more, we're finding that the kinetics is quite comparable. But uh, you know, most of these materials fully load in a few minutes, uh, and not in uh, uh, tens of minutes or hours, um, which are chemisorbent, which might be the case for a chemisorbent. So the, the kinetics is sometimes surprisingly fast, and separations where there's selectivity, it's because the material adapted a structure which fit that particular orbit, which is why it opened in the first place. Which is why, by the way, uh, Jeff, we need an in-situ uh, absorption structural tools that um, I, I alluded to at the end of my prayer. Yeah, so we, I'm, I'm very sorry that agree. I didn't show any, <laughs> I, I'm very we sorry that agree. I didn't show any micro micrometrics instruments, but all of our DVS instruments are made by uh, SMS. But I should point out I'm a great customer for Micromeritics. We have three three flexes, uh, uh, and so we're, we're, we're great uh, believers in Micromeritics. I just happen to show the vapors option, and, and our, I guess, partner in uh, or vendor in, in vapors option has been SMS. So uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not. Uh, uh, being negative about micrometrics at all, uh, you know, th those are the instruments we selected for the gas option part of our program. So uh, we've got a question about the ROS material versus um, a silica lithium bromide composite. Um, does the ROS material outperform the silica lithium bromide systems? I think I know what you're referring to. Uh, um, there, there's a, 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 I, I didn't see the question, but I, a, there, there's a group in Russia that has been studying these for, for decades now. Uh, and the, you know, if you have, well, I, I can't, we haven't compared them directly. Uh, well, all I can tell you is that our, uh, our kinetics is, is of unloading, the energies of unloading are very good, right? So the, for CO2 and for water, uh, uh, it's a straight up physics option. You only have to break hydrogen bonds uh, to release the vapor after it's been captured. The Anything with lithium in it, and I'm thinking of zeolites, where you can have modified zeolites, you know, lithium is the top sodium in the structure, is there's a combination of chemical and physical absorption. Uh, and getting that water off uh, off an alkali metal is non-trivial. Uh, so I, I can't give a direct answer because we haven't compared uh, side by side under our testing conditions. Uh, but anything which has a, an extremely strong um, hydrophilic type structure with alkali metal cations is likely to have real problems with heat needed to recycle, which is the problem for zeolites. They're brilliant at capture, but they're not so good at release. <clears throat> yeah, they, they don't like release at all. <laughs> the temperatures are quite high. Um, uh, we've got time for one more question. Uh, we're almost out of time this morning. Um, the materials you described early on that were very effective for CO2 capture, um, could these be used in an industrial scrubber? to capture off-gasses, 
or some application like that where concentrations of CO2 are quite high? Uh, in principle, yes. In, in practice, if you can capture CO2 from air, I, di I didn't point that out, uh, but when you have a selectivity of 20,000 to CO2 over nitrogen, uh, you're capturing CO2 from the air in this room. And we do have a parallel project on DAC. Uh, and uh, it, it's even I'm surprised by how effective these materials are. Uh, so I didn't talk about it, but you can take 400 ppm CO2 in air and reduce it to one ppm by running it down a column. So, so the materials are absorbing air, uh, CO2 from air at air level concentrations spontaneously, basically, uh, and only require the 50 or 60 degrees uh, to heat. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to go back to this is something that wasn't on the table five or six years ago because there were no physisorbents that had such strong binding affinity. But the beauty of these materials with a physisorbent is they're strong enough to capture, but they're weak enough to release under relatively mild heating. So to answer the question, it's a long answer to the question, but I don't think you need to worry about flue gas if you can capture CO2 from air anywhere, anytime, and hopefully use that CO2 uh, for an end product. Uh, so that's my personal belief is why would you try to clean up flue glass uh, when you can capture it anywhere where it can be used in situ. And I have to say, uh, you know, living in Ireland, there's a panic every now and then when the CO2 goes away. CO2 is a commodity, right? They had a, there, was, there was a threat of a beer shortage in Ireland because Guinness couldn't get a hold on CO2 supplies, right? So no matter what you think, there, there actually is a potential immediate application uh, for CO2 in carbonated beverages. Uh, why uh, produce it and put it in cylinders and transport it when you could actually on site at the factory have your own CO2 generator by DAC? <clears throat> yeah, Mike, thank you very much. Um, for a wonderful presentation and discussion today. Um, that's all the questions we have time for today. Uh, if we haven't been able to get to your question, one of our application team will be in touch shortly. Uh, Mike, is there anything else you'd like to mention today? No, I, I'm just uh, 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 appreciate the opportunity to speak and uh, hopefully um, uh, there is reason for great optimism, and it's not necessarily just from my work. There are other people pursuing these advanced materials around the world, and it's not they're not that far away from prime time. Now, this is not like a pharmaceutical where it's going to take 10 years of testing. Uh, if you come up with a better absorbent, uh, you're only a year or two or three from implementation. So. Uh, I think there's every reason for optimism that we're going to see new technologies from advanced physics organs coming down the pipeline in the, in the next five to ten years. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. Uh, if you have any feedback for us, we'd be grateful if you could complete the survey, which will be distributed in our follow-up email. We hope you found the session beneficial. Do not forget to check back for upcoming webinars on micromerdix.com slash webinars. Uh, we hope to welcome you again soon. Thank you and have a great day.